Thank you so much for accepting to be with us tonight. It's very much appreciated. We know it's a very busy day today for many persons like you in the United States today. For, and we appreciate very much that you have uh, seven or ten minutes to, I mean, to be with us. Um, um, let me ask you a very straightforward question. If Romney would win the elections, why would he win the elections? And if Barack Obama would win the elections, why? What is the reason he would actually win? I mean, what, what would make the difference in both cases? I mean, what could be really the key points? Well, the main issue in our election, uh, and it's the case in many elections around the world, is the economy and what's going on in our economy in America. So I've always thought that President Obama would have trouble getting reelected with uh, eight or nine or 10 percent unemployment, which is what we've had in the United States over the last three or four years. So the biggest argument for Governor Romney is that uh, he will assert that he can make the economy better for people and get unemployment down, get more people uh, into jobs and uh, have a better economic uh, set of ideas. Uh, Barack Obama is uh, going to argue that uh, even though he hasn't achieved uh, everything he wanted to achieve with the economy, that he has made it better than it was when he came in the office. He has gotten a health care uh, plan through that should help everybody have health care insurance in America, and that he needs four more years to complete his economic work and to get uh, unemployment down and to get more people uh, to be employed. So those are the two major arguments that uh, that are being uh, that have been advocated over the last year, and uh, we'll see in a few hours uh, who won the argument. Well, yes, um, we as you as you probably know, this this evening uh, and night we are having here in Florence uh, was actually preceded by another element of this meeting. Uh, which was a seminar for students, for Italian students and U.S. students in Florence, uh, exactly on the issue of the U.S. elections and human rights. Uh, so we had very interesting perspectives on, uh, on the various aspects of, of the U.S. politics, and we were always trying to relate it uh, to the issue of human rights. But one issue that came up very, very clearly is the increasing polarization of politics in the United States. Uh, by the way, not only in the United States, but certainly in the United States, which uh, increasingly makes it difficult to cross the aisle. So uh, could one say that whoever wins these elections as a president would nevertheless probably have at least part of the Congress not on its favor, and that being, in the end, a major obstacle to make, uh, I mean, to formulate any or almost any significant policies. So what, ca what can you say is about the polarization and about actually the governability, if that's the correct word, of the US political system? Well, the thing that you've got to remember always is that uh, democracy or politics is a substitute for violence. Uh, it is here in the United States and it is in many countries around the world although there are countries in the world where they don't have politics, they don't have democracy, and they have violence. Uh, so that, that's the first thing to always remember. So if it is a self violence... We lost the audio. You're not hearing yes, me now? Yes, we're hearing you again, yes. yes. Okay. So what I was saying was uh, politics is a substitute for violence. Democracy is a substitute for violence in, in all countries where, where it's practiced. So it's very easy, if you believe that, to see that it, you can have polarization because that's, that's the nature of what you're doing. I mean, when you have a democracy, you want uh, 200 people or 300 people or is in our case in America, 535 people serve in the Congress representing all the American people, and they are trying to make very controversial decisions on a whole range of subjects, 
and people feel very strongly about it and they're emotional about it. So it's very easy to see how there would be polarization, bitterness, difficulty, arguments, and even hatred. I mean, people get very exercised when they are debating issues and it's very easy to say, I disagree with you. And in fact, I hate you because I disagree with you. So this is a, the nature of politics. It's the nature of democracy. Uh, so, but when you actually have to make tough decisions, it's very important to be able to get what we call bipartisan votes to reach across the aisle, to get people from the other side to work with you and vote with you on doing very tough things. And that means you have to compromise. Mr. Gepner, that means you, Mr. go ahead. Sorry, we, we can't really see your face. I think you moved from the, the camp. Yes, okay, now it's better. <laughs> okay, I didn't see that. <laughs> Thank okay. you. We so, did hear so, you, but we couldn't see you anymore. Okay, okay good. So that's, that's compromise, and that's giving up everything that you, you know, a lot of things that you want. Uh, I have a saying, there's, I've never seen a good compromise where anybody at the end of it was happy. Everybody's unhappy because they didn't get everything they want. We're talking, so, about, uh, talking about compromise. Maybe um, Bar Barack Obama was the, a good president. I mean, he's a lawyer, so he, he should be acquainted with uh, compromises or no? Well, he, he, he is. and. I think he really tried to get a compromise, and he would argue that the Republicans were unwilling to compromise, that they wanted, you know, everything and would give up nothing, would agree to no revenue increases, for instance, in the budget. So that would be his position. Uh, the Republicans would say he wouldn't compromise enough, and that's often what you get when compromise fails is both sides blame the other. That's polarization. The, the compromise. Indeed. <laughs> um, That's the way it works. Yes. Um, I have another question since uh, we, we, we haven't here, we have spoken about it a little bit. Um, I'm not sure how much it came up into in, in the debates, but um, what about the votes of the Hispanics? The Hispanic vote uh, is changing, has changed with Obama. Uh, and other minorities' votes have changed, of course, in the previous elections. How, how does the minority, uh, which of course are large uh, parts of the population eventually, of course, how do they influence eventually the balance of uh, who will win the elections? I mean, who is voting for whom more, let's say, uh, significantly than, other, than for others? Right. Well, I think you'll see in this election uh, probably maybe 70 percent of the Hispanic population, which is growing in number rapidly in the United States, will vote for Barack Obama. Probably 95 percent of the African American population will, will vote for Barack Obama. Uh, and uh, probably only 37, 38 percent of the white population will vote for Barack Obama. But if he gets those numbers out of the African-American population and the Hispanic uh, population, he should win the election. He should get to 50 or 51 percent of the total vote. And all of that is to say that the demography of the United States is changing rapidly. So to give you some numbers, the, in, the, in the 2008 election, about 74% of the electorate was white, and the rest were uh, African American, Hispanic, other ethnic groups that make up the population. In this election, the white content in the electorate will be down to 72%. And if you look at demography in the United States, that number of whites in the electorate will continue to diminish in the years ahead, to the point that in some years ahead, uh, the non-white part of the electorate will be a majority in the United States. So that's been a, had a big role in, in Barack Obama's election in 08, and I think will have a big role in his re-election, which I suspect will happen tonight in 2012.
Can we say, uh, Mr., we, um, you started your uh, interview uh, with, uh, with us uh, talking about the importance, of course, of the economy as an issue in this election. Can we say there is also, uh, since what you just said, um, a race issue? I mean, uh, uh, you said that um, white, probably uh, a lot of them will not vote for, for Obama. And uh, do you think this... Uh, the, the color of the skin of Mr. President Barack Obama affects the vote today, these hours? It, it has an impact, but the thing to remember is that he is the first African-American president in history in the United States. So I guess I'd, I'd put it in a positive tone by saying that uh, uh, you know, 30, 50 years ago, I don't think an African-American could have gotten elected because of race in the United States. But in 2008, he did get elected, and I suspect tonight he will be reelected, and he will get 37, 38 percent of the white vote. So, uh, yes, racism is, is still a, an issue in the United States. It's still a problem. It hasn't gone away completely. We're not all colorblind, even though we would hope people would be. But we've made a lot of progress. And uh, I think this, and if he gets reelected tonight, it truly is, it, it has almost as historic as him getting elected in the first place in 2008. Can, can I ask you where, where are you right now? In what part of the United States you are? I'm actually in California. Okay. Uh, I'm I'm in California. I just wanted to know the how 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 are things going as far as votes are are. I mean, it, the, do you see a lot is, of people go vote? Do you see queues? Do you see a chaos or as as and is everything going all right? No, I think it's largely going fine. Uh, there will undoubtedly be places where. There will be controversy and people will feel they're not being allowed to vote and the polls in some places will close too early. And there, there's always problems when you have human beings involved in an election. But I'd say that, you know, largely this will be an uneventful election. The votes will be counted and uh, uh, whoever wins will win. And people won't feel that there was uh, anybody stealing votes or fixing the election. It will be seen as a valid election across the country. Thank I think so there are some students that maybe they, there someone that wants... From, there are students from California here even. Uh, but that there's, mean that they for are, sure there's a girl from Los Angeles, I think, Taylor, I think. <laughs> but Taylor, I remember her. <laughs> anyway, is there anyone who wants to ask a question? To or make a comment? Or... Kebert, or make a comment? Please go ahead. Oh, it's, uh, it has grown silent. They have made a lot of questions before, <laughs> asked a lot of questions. This may be a, a lower point tonight, but uh, the issue of race has come up in our course. Uh, a number of other issues have come up. Uh, but at this moment, I didn't, I mean, a few students have, have, have gone up and, uh, oh yes, I see a question. I see a person who raises his hand, so can you please introduce yourself and get a microphone? Hi, my name is Charles Pulliam Moore. I'm a student from the George Washington University in Washington, D.C. Um, and I wanted to ask what you thought about the ways in which the Conservative Party has had concerted efforts towards voter suppression in certain swing states, particularly against minority groups like Latinos and African Americans, if we're going to talk about uh, the role that race plays in this election. Um, I'm thinking in particular about mailers that had gone out to tell Latino voters in particular not to vote until November the 8th, which is obviously two days after the election. Um, yeah. Sure. Well, it, it's, uh, I think, uh, unfortunately, we've seen a number of efforts around the country to suppress uh, the voting of people, mostly on the Democratic side, I'm afraid. Um, I haven't seen any efforts that I've heard of about Democrats trying to suppress the Republican vote or the conservative vote. And uh, as you know, it's um, sometimes easier to, to uh, frighten uh, new voters, uh, maybe immigrants who just became citizens. 
into not voting. Um, I frankly, you know, don't think those efforts largely succeed. I think they fail, uh, but that doesn't mean people won't try to do that. Um, as I said a moment ago, politics is a substitute for violence. So, uh, you know, voter suppression is uh, not violence, but it's uh, getting toward it. And when people's emotions run very high and they, they do things they shouldn't do, and uh, that's where voter suppression comes in. So I'm worried about it. I think we have to guard against it. We have to make sure that we uh, stop any efforts uh, in this regard that we can. But that doesn't mean people won't stop trying. And uh, unfortunately, I think we're going to have this in the future, and uh, we're going to have to guard against it all we can. Thank you. Any, any other question? Um, Taylor. Yes, we have, we have a question. Um, one second, because the microphone is, is, is moved around. Hi, um, my name is Taylor Hooks, and I'm the Californian, so I'm saying hello <laughs> to my home, my home state. Um, I miss it a lot. Uh, my question is about economics and how it ties to race. Um, Mitt Romney has run on a platform largely um, to improve the economy, but um, those who have been hurt most by the economy largely have been um, minorities, Latinos, African Americans. So how do you think Mitt Romney has um, done in terms of reaching those voters and improving, speaking to them about improving their economic situation, or how has he missed an opportunity here? Well, I, you know, I think uh, he's probably been fairly effective with a lot of people who are unemployed or have economic problems. Their house is underwater or they lost their job just because he's the alternative uh, product, if you will. Um, I think a lot of voters look at politicians the way they do plumbers. Um, if I hire a plumber to fix a leaky pipe. If they fix the pipe, I'll rehire them. If they don't fix the pipe, they don't get rehired. And it's to me, it's with a lot of people, it's no more complicated than that. And so I think Mitt Romney probably is getting some votes from some people that he ordinarily wouldn't uh, just because they want change. They want the alternative plumber, if you will to fix the leaky pipe. But if you look at his, you know, his track record, his programs, what he's done in the private sector, I mean, the conservative Republican Party, to me, is not the party of working people. It's not the party of people that are poor and trying to get on the ladder of opportunity. Uh, Barack Obama has done a lot for education. He's done a lot for training. He, he got a stimulus bill through when we were in the depths of the recession that hired a lot of people around the country. Uh, if you look at the internal arguments between the candidates, I would think people who are struggling would vote for Barack Obama and, 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 and the programs that he's espoused and that he will try to put in place over the next four years. But again, a lot of voters don't get into all that. They don't get into all those specifics and all that detail. They just, they want results. And if they don't get the results, they vote for the alternative. So that's kind of what Obama is facing tonight and why I've always thought that with high unemployment, he would have a rough time getting reelected. But hopefully, from my viewpoint, he will. Vic Eppard, thank you so much for being with us. Great. Very much thank appreciated. You so much. Good luck. Thank you, you too.